t- uh, again today, and uh, today is uh, kind of like a family Sunday. We're doing some straight up fam jam today, so it's awesome to have everyone. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. Thanks for all the students and the kids uh, who've, who've joined us in, uh, in the big auditorium church this morning. Uh, but if you've been here over the last couple weeks, you know that we are in a Jesus is series, and we've talked about how if Jesus really did resurrect from the dead, then what the Bible says about Jesus is actually true. And Jesus did resurrect from the dead. We talked a little bit about the historical argument for that and how we consider that to be a historical fact. And because Jesus resurrected from the dead, the Bible says that Jesus is accessible. He's available to us. Jesus is merciful. He doesn't give us what we deserve. Jesus is gracious. He gives us something a.k.a. salvation, that we do not deserve. I mean, Jesus is incredible. And today we're going to be talking about how Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful. And so we're going to pray uh, that God would open up our hearts to his word this morning and then just dive right in. So if you'll pray with me. Lord, we just come to you this morning and we ask that uh, you're able to open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Father, we pray that you will remove all uh, confusion and thoughtfulness and things that just are trying to captivate our mind to distract us from being closer to you through worship, through the word this morning. God, I pray that we will be able to be convicted in such a way that we would live our lives in trust of you, trusting in your faithfulness, trusting in your goodness and your mercy and your love and your grace. Father, be with us this morning, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it comes to no surprise that when you consider our culture, uh, it is a culture that typically breaks his promises. I mean, think about it. How many of us could remember the last time, probably within the last week or so, where we promised to do something or we thought we were going to do something and then we didn't follow through? Our culture really does break their promises. All you have to do is listen to a politician for 15 minutes, right, who makes promises and then what eventually happens, right? They break their promises. They don't follow through. Uh, And so it's just, it saturates our culture. We live in a culture where the divorce rate is as high as it's ever been. I mean, think about that. If people are willing to break the most sacred, treasured promise that they could ever make to somebody, If we're willing to break something like that, what aren't we willing to break? Marriage in our society has just been basically flushed down the toilet to where it just becomes something along the lines of, hey, we're in this until it just doesn't work anymore. That's what marriage is, but marriage is sacred. One of the most negative impacts on a child's life can be a parent who breaks their promises. I really like this Christmas movie. I was raised on it, Jingle All the Way, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it was a great movie, but Arnold is known as the dad who breaks his promises, right? Uh, He promised stuff all throughout his child's life, and he constantly just dropped the ball, didn't show up. A few things that are key points in the movie is the opening scene is he promised his son he would be at the karate promotion, and what happened? He broke his promise. Business was more important than being there for his son. And then he promised to get his son this really cool toy. It was Turbo Man. And, uh, and, and he didn't get it. He forgot about it. He broke his promise. And his wife says, you remember to get that Turbo Man doll, right? Because basically, practically right now, there would be no way you could get it. He goes, yeah, 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 I got it. And then the lights go off and his face looks up at the camera like, I broke my promise. I forgot. And so in a mad dash, when he goes to get this Turbo Toy, this Turbo Man toy, which is not going to happen, he's not going to be able to find it, he's supposed to take his son and go with his family to this parade where Turbo Man is going to be there live. And so he tells his son, he says, son, I will be at the parade, I promise. And his son, as soon as he says that, his son, his face changes and he's just like, oh yeah, right, I've heard this once or twice, you know what I mean? But that is, that is true. We are human. And we break our promises, whether intentionally or unintentionally, don't we? I mean, there are a lot of things that I don't even mean to break a promise on, but I do. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll send you that information. And then I totally forget. Just ask my wife, Angel, I forget stuff all the time. It's terrible. But that's who we are. We break our promises. But there's something about God. When you look at his nature in the Bible, it is this word, faithfulness. God is faithful. Mason read this scripture to you. I want to read it again. It says in Lamentations 3, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When Paul writes to Timothy, 
And he gives this wonderful uh, description of who God is. And he says this, Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. In other words, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, even though we have become a Christian and we've said, God, I promise to follow you and go away from my sin, and we make God that promise, and then we break it, God is still faithful to us. He still keeps his word. He still keeps his promises. God is faithful. And I am so glad that he is, aren't you? Because I mess up and I make mistakes and I let God down, but God never breaks his promise. If we could define faithfulness, I would say it's this, trustworthy, loyal, a covenant keeper. In the Old Testament, it meant to be something that supports another thing, like a, like a, a leg on a table. It's a supporting role. It just will not break. It will not fail. It's something that can be trusted. And in other senses in the Bible and also in Greek literature, this word faithfulness is used of a banker who always follows through on his promises. You can depend that your money will be there. You can trust it, right? That's what it, that's what it means to be faithful. It means to be a person who can be relied on. And if I have to admit something, there are, like I said, times where I make mistakes. And I've only done this once, okay? So don't think that I'm a terrible father. But when we have our leadership meetings, we meet about once a month. And so we meet in one of the rooms down the hall, and it's usually for two to three hours, and we just go over stuff that needs to be talked about. Well, you know, sometimes in the meetings, your mind gets captivated by something. And I was thinking, and then I was talking with Toby, one of our elders out in the parking lot, and I'm just thinking about what we talked about, and I'm on my way home, and I'm like, on my way home. And I get a call from, from Judy. She watches Piper and she says, uh, hey, hey dude, are, are you still going to come get Piper? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm on my way. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. I forgot, right? I never told Angel that. So this is the first time she's hearing about it. And uh, <laughs> one time, that's the only time I've ever done that, okay? I wasn't that far away, all right? It's only like 10 minutes or so. So that's not that bad. But we mess up. We, we forget stuff. Look, I was forgotten by my dad one day after school. He was supposed to pick me up. People were like, are you, are you sure he's going to get you? And I remember, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, yeah, my dad said he'd be here. He's going to be here. An hour went by. I had to call my mom because dad forgot to come get me, right? And there's even weird stuff. Like I've shared with, this, you, with, this, uh, with you before is that like when my dad died, I was just like, I felt like my dad should have not died <laughs> and that he like broke a promise to me. You know, being a father, you're supposed to be there and take care of, of his kids. And when my dad died, I almost felt like, and it's so weird to describe, I almost felt like my dad broke a promise being my dad and he was supposed to be there for me, but he wasn't. And then that led into this really weird feeling about how I felt about God because I had this misconception that God is somebody who never lets me go through anything bad. And that when he does, he's kind of like my dad who lets me down. And so you start to lose trust with God. And so when bad things happen to me, like my dad dying or certain situations with my family, I begin to look at God as this person who's just ready to punish me and break his promise. And the moment that he's ready to strike me down, then I just give in. And I'm like, is this really who God is? But when I read the word, the Bible talks about how God is faithful. God is somebody that I can trust. And so is God just going to punish me and not save me because I make a mistake and I fail and I let him down? The answer is no. Why? Because God is faithful. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 puts it like this. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? You see, God isn't like us. He doesn't make promises and then break them. He doesn't promise to do something and then forget about them. He doesn't get distracted by things that he's talked about and things that are on his mind and then he forgets to love us and take care of us. God is not like us. God is faithful. And when you read the Bible in the Old Testament over and over again, it talks about how God promised something and then he fulfilled it. Let me give you a few examples. God has an incredible track record. God promised to bring an end to the work and the power of Satan when he tempted Adam and Eve. And you can read this in Genesis 3.15. He told Satan, he said, Satan, you're going to bruise this coming man's heel, but he's going to crush your head. And that's what happened on the cross. Satan bruised Jesus' heel through crucifixion. Yet it was through the crucifixion that he crushed Satan's head and he overcame him and defeated him. 
It was through the cross. God promised it at the beginning of the world, and then he did it. God promised to bring a flood upon the world, but also save Noah and his family because mankind had gotten so wretched and so terrible, God destroyed it to start anew. God promised it, and he did it. God promised Moses and the Israelites that if they would obey, he would bring them out of Egypt into the promised land. God promised it, and he did it. God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. I will give you a land to inherit uh, and that will be for you and for your people. God promised it, and God fulfilled his promise. Let me read to you this scripture. It says in Joshua 21, 43 through 45, it says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and they lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not one of their enemies stood before them. For the Lord gave their enemies into their hand. Not one, not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. You know, there's still people today who are looking for God to make good on his land promise. God already did that. He fulfilled it. And the Jews chose to reject it and give it up. But God keeps his promises every time. You see, the greatest enemy of our faithfulness to God is the failure to remember all that God has done in history. I mean, God has worked in our life. He has worked in history time and time again. And sometimes we get distracted by our present troubles and we think, is God going to keep his promise this time? And the answer is yes, yes. So don't let Satan get in your mind and defeat you and trick you into thinking that God isn't going to fulfill his promises because he is not like us. He is going to keep his promise. You know, one of the most incredible aspects of the Bible, and it's an argument for the truthfulness of Christianity on top of many other arguments, okay? You've got scientific arguments. You've got arguments from logic. You've got arguments from history. You've got arguments just from the world around us. But when you look at the Bible... It's called an internal evidence. And one of the greatest arguments for the Bible is the fulfillment of prophecy, right? The fulfillment of prophecy. There are over 300 prophecies made about Jesus in the Old Testament. Over 300. And he fulfilled all of them. One mathematician who who did this incredible work, he calculated a probability that these prophecies, just eight of them, not 300, just eight, would be fulfilled in the life of one person accidentally. One person, accidentally. You know what that probability is? One in ten to the 17th power. That's insane. That's just eight. And these prophecies about Jesus were out of his control. Like where he was born, for instance. Or how he would be crucified. Or what would be said about him. And that is just eight prophecies in the Old Testament. And yet God fulfilled over 300 of them in the person of Jesus What could be considered impossible was fulfilled in Jesus. Why? Because God is faithful. One of the famous mathematicians, and many of you have heard this before, he said, let me give you an illustration. Let me put this in practical terms to show you the faithfulness of God. The idea that eight of these prophecies could be fulfilled in the person of Jesus is like this. Take the state of Texas, fill it up with quarters, every square inch, a foot deep. Mark one of them red with an X, and you get one chance to pick out the right one, but here's the deal. You're blindfolded. You're blindfolded. One chance to pick out the right quarter, and you do. That's the probability of all of these prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus. Isn't that incredible? God is faithful. And who are we looking at this morning? Especially in this day and age where people break their promises and let each other down. I have done it. You have done it. It is Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of God's faithfulness. He is the person that God appointed over his house to never let us down. And Jesus proved himself. You know, isn't it easy to be faithful to something when things are going well? Isn't it? Right? You can can really fulfill your promises when there's no distractions, there's no problems, there's no money commitments. I mean, it is easy, right? Right? When, when things are going well and everything's great, you fulfill your promises. But you know the faithfulness of a person when times get tough. Marriages, for instance, right? Those of you who are married, things ever get tough for you? 
Absolutely they get tough. But you know the test of your faithfulness when things get tough, yet you stick to your promises. It's when you're alone in the front of your computer screen and no one else is around you, do you discover your faithfulness to sexual purity. It's when you've been married for a few years and hard times press in, do you know the faithfulness of your spouse. It's when you are faced with donuts on a Sunday morning and you're trying to diet. Do you know your faithfulness to your diet? Hey, look, you put a donut in front of me, it's, it's gone. It's gone. And let me share a story with you, and this is humiliating. But I'm sharing it anyways, right? Angel wanted me to get her donuts, and I said no. And so naturally I got her donuts, and yeah. So I went and picked her up. You know why I didn't want to get her donuts? Because I would eat them, right? And so I told Angel she had two donuts, and I said, look, just throw the rest away because I don't want to eat them. So she takes the box and just puts it in an empty trash bag, right? There's nothing else in it. I am so sick. That when she got a shower, I went in and ate a donut. (laughs) Isn't that pathetic? And she said, Rick, did you eat a donut? (laughs) I said, yes, I did. She said, there's something wrong with you. I said, I know. (laughs) I mean, if donuts are there, I will eat them. I'm sorry. It's terrible. And I'm trying to be better. But I'm just pathetic. That's the bottom line. So it's when we know we go through tough things like this that are we faithful It's when the pressure is on in our life as a Christian, do we know, are we faithful to Jesus? When the money starts running low and you've made a commitment to give to the Lord and be charitable, that's tough, isn't it? It's when you start getting persecuted at church amongst Christians. You're like, man, this is supposed to be the church. Is this what Christianity is all about? And it gets tough because you're with a group of messy people who judge and criticize and hurt, but also encourage and love and embrace. Yeah, you got to find those people. But man, it's when you're in those moments, you're like, is this, is this worth it? Should I be faithful? It's when you're at work and you're invited to happy hour and everyone's getting drunk and you're past one beer after two, after three, that you're tested with drunkenness because you're pressured socially. It's when you see everybody on Facebook getting the new houses and the new cars and you're like, man, materialism is it. But am I going to be faithful to God? This morning, I'd like to share with you this passage. And look, don't freak out, okay? Because I'm not going to go an extra 40 minutes. It's going to be quick. It's going to be brief. But... This passage is in 1 Peter chapter 2. Shame on you for looking at the clock for those of you who did it. I saw you. You don't think I can see? I can see you. But this is an example that Jesus gives of his faithfulness. And he gives us an example that we should follow. A little bit of background about this passage is that Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are under persecution. But specifically in this context, it is people who are at work with masters who are both good and both bad. They are slaves. Slavery was a whole lot different back then than it was today. We think of slavery in the Bible like a plantation in southern America, you know, back in the 1800s. But that's not what slavery was like in the Bible, right? Sometimes it was, and God said, people who do this thing are sinning. It is wrong to be men stealers is what he calls them. But then you had a different kind of slavery. And if you could picture it like this, a lot of times in the, in the Old Testament, um, even in the biblical Greek times when Jesus was on the scene, people would actually sell themselves into slavery because they would die. And so they would put themselves into the debt of certain masters and certain servants, and they would serve them faithfully. I get to live in exchange for serving you. Well, as you can imagine, some of those masters were good, and some of them were really, really bad. And let's face it, these Christians were having a really hard time serving under masters who were mean and cruel and selfish. And so they were like, I quit. I break my promise. Even though you've helped take care of me and we made this whole deal, I'm not serving under a master who treats me this way. And a lot of us can understand, right? You've been at your job, at work, maybe even volunteering somewhere. It's tough to work with difficult people. But Peter gives us this description of how we should handle this confrontation. When the going gets tough, what should we do? And he says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, he says this, Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. 
For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. It is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that when they felt this pressure and this persecution that Peter says, look to Jesus, because he is the embodiment of the faithfulness of God. You know, I haven't always worked in ministry. Um, My first job when I moved to Bible college, I worked at this company called White Properties of Winchester, Virginia, and it was a good company, but like working in a secular company, you have bosses and you have people in in your job, and it can be negative, it can be challenging. Well, at the end of every day, we had to write a report of what we did for that day, and conflict began to build up because I just felt like I was just being persecuted for being a Christian. Sometimes they would make fun of me and call me names. One guy threatened to fight with me, and I'm like, let's go. (laughs) He goes, you know, yeah, you're a Christian, whatever. Look, your sleeve's cut off. I was like, let's go fight right now, Christian or not. Let's do this, right? Just totally falling into the flesh. I mean, I was suffering. 19 years old, little hothead. Some of you have been there, right? So I was the kind of guy, though, like I wasn't like the meek and gentle, like in the face of persecution, like the Bible says, like just be in control and turn your cheek. I was like, let's throw down because I'm not going to be treated this way. (laughs) So in other words, I didn't follow what we find Jesus doing. But I've learned being out of, you know, in the ministry now, it's okay. But anyways, I'm ashamed to say that. It's not really that funny. But I was making $9 an hour delivering different files to the D.C. area. And then this guy who was the friend of the boss came in. And within the first few days, I found out that he was making $10 an hour, and I was making $9 an hour being there for an entire year. I'm like, this is, this is partial. This isn't fair. Is it because I'm a Christian? You start thinking about those things. You know what I mean? When I worked at the next job that I was at at a dentist office, the dentist promised us a certain quota. I worked two jobs when I was in the beginning part of my ministry. And the promise was this. If we do such a good job that we make X amount of money, right, we hit our quota, you will get a percentage Here's the problem. We destroyed the quota. I was getting ready to receive a $1,000 check. And I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. Well, guess what? That was too much money for him. And so he says, I'm, you guys, he literally said this. Do you guys really think you're worth that much? All, everybody was super hot, really upset. I ended up only getting 100 bucks. But man, he mistreated us in that part. And he, he broke his promise. And it was really, really hurtful. And there are things that we go through Angel, for instance, she had a company that she worked for, a big company up in Baltimore, right? One of the most popular brands in America. And she was supposed to get a, they get a bonus if they reach a certain goal, and it was 20%, and they exceeded uh, right around that area, right around 20%. Well, the company decided to move the goalposts and made it unattainable so that they wouldn't get their full bonuses. Shrewdness, man. I mean, it's about money, right? It's about business. And we can go through things like this. People break our trust all the time, not only in the workplace, but in the home. And these slaves are going through the exact same thing. Here's the question. When you go through something like that, what is a Christ-like response? A little hot-headed 19-year-old didn't really even understand what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, but I wanted to be. And I wish I would have known this because I ruined my reputation with people. And we can ruin our reputation as well. And so when this pressure is on, first of all, Peter says, look what he said in verse 21, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow. When the going got tough and Jesus suffered for things that he didn't even do, he was still faithful. How many of us would be tempted to break our promises to God if we were accused of something that we never did in the first place? We were truly innocent. And yet we face this persecution and this pressure. How many of us would be willing to lash out in response, to just give up, to be angry at God? But yet the Bible says Jesus left us an example, a pattern. It's like walking through the snow and you see footsteps through the snow and you step in those same footsteps rather than making your own path. And so what is it about Jesus that leads us to place our destiny in his hands? Why should we follow Jesus' example, in other words? Well, here's the answer that he gives. He quotes Isaiah 53, 9. He says, he who did not commit sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, this innocent man was willing to be faithful, even when he had every reason not to be. Jesus was faithful to God. Look what else it says in this passage of Peter. It says, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. 
I mean, think about this. After Jesus would preach something, he would often be tested about what he preached. And here's the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, You have heard it said unto you, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, you should pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. If you are slapped on the cheek, turn to him the other also. What that literally means is, if you are verbally assaulted, welcome more. Allow it to be done. And this is true, and I should clarify, right, in this passage. A lot of people mistake this for being physically attacked. That's not the context of this passage. We as Christians have every single right to defend ourselves, whether at war with another country, with an idea, whether we're attacked in our home. The Bible never calls us to just roll over and take physical persecution. There are certain circumstances in which that is necessary, but if you come under physical attack, you are absolutely allowed to defend yourself and your family unless you feel like the circumstances weren't otherwise, okay? So I want to make that really clear. But what we're talking about here is religious and social persecution. And the thing about Jesus is that this was totally unknown to the Jews. The Jews were fighters, man. When people tried to invade their territory, and they often would win, the Jews would often fight down to the very last man. In Greek culture, um, you had this Maccabean revolt where the Greeks were persecuting the Jews, and they covered this, this in history, and you could go read about it. It's really incredible. But here's some of the things that they wrote about their enemies when they were attacked. Let me, let me read a few to you. You will not escape the hand of God. You have made war with God by making war with us. You will undergo unceasing torments. In other words, you mess with us, you're going to burn, right? How many of us have felt that way? You're like, man, I'm just waiting to see what God does to this person. He's going to take him out. Maybe I could be his vessel, you know what I mean? Maybe I could be the instrument by which that happens. And if I accidentally slip and jab them in the throat or something like that, it's all good because they persecuted me, right? Maybe I'll rat them out and expose them. Man, I'll be God's vessel. I'll be the one who gives justice. That's what we think. But yet here's Jesus under persecution, verbal insults, physical violence, and he says, God, you're in control. I'm giving it up to you. I'm moving myself out of the equation because when I try to be the person to execute justice, I mess it up. Do you trust God that much? Let me read to you this passage in Romans chapter 12. It says this, do not repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not, be, do not be overcome by evil. And look at this. Overcome evil with good. And this is tough. Because we want to lash out and retaliate and get vengeance and let it be us because it feels so good. It's a sin of the flesh, man. And yet the Bible over and over again says, God's got this. Don't mess it up by trying to take control yourself. God's got this. Why? God is faithful. He doesn't break his promises. And as a faithful person, we should be someone who leaves judgment up to God because God is faithful. Let me encourage you this morning with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It says, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. God will give you the strength that you need to endure that persecution, whatever form it is, financial, social, relational, physical, God is going to give you the strength. Let him be your strength. It says in verse 24 that Jesus himself bore our sins on the cross. And he says, by his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus was faithful, not just in social persecution or even being hit and punched. Jesus was faithful to the cross, even to death. I mean, he could have been ready to be nailed on the cross and say, look, not worth it made a mistake, I'm not the Messiah, I don't want to die for the world, this is too much. I've gone way too far. He went to the cross. He was faithful even to the point of death. And because Jesus was faithful to the cross, he opened up a treasure full of God's promises to those who trust in Jesus. Over and over again, we find so many promises from God. We just read one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let me show you another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Here's a promise. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. 
And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is a promise to Christians. And if you're not in Christ this morning, this does not apply to you. These promises are for those who place their trust in the cross. But God is for you. He is faithful. He's not going to let you go through something that he doesn't already know you can make it through. And when you are going through something where you feel like you are so broken that it is too much, God promises he will give you a way out so that you can endure it. You can make it through. God is faithful. But even when we do mess up and we make mistakes, and instead of taking the way out that God has given us, we decide to take the way in to sin, God is so faithful. Look at what it says. Because Jesus was faithful to the cross, we know that as Christians, when we approach God with our sin and we confess it, we know we have forgiveness. 1 John 1.19 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Man, maybe you've messed up. Maybe you've made mistakes. Maybe you've broken your promise to your spouse Maybe you've broken your promise to God by looking at porn. Maybe you've broken your promise by God to, to withhold your finances and not give to him. Maybe you've broken your promise to God by lying and stealing and cheating. Maybe you've gotten drunk. Maybe you have just made so many mistakes and you think, how could I come to God? Can I really trust God that he will forgive me when I come to him 99 times a thousand? Will God forgive me? I don't know if I can really trust him because we are in a culture where people break their promises. But God is faithful. He will forgive you. If you are a Christian and you've messed up and you come to God with your sins, he will forgive you. You see, the truth is, verse 25 in 1 Peter 2 said this, You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Because Jesus was faithful to the cross, because God is faithful, he is able God is able to save you, protect you, redeem you, forgive you, and enable you to live the life that you have always wanted to live, a faithful and fruitful Christian. When we remember all that God has done for us in the past, we can trust him with our future. And when we remember all that Jesus has done in our lives, we can trust trust Jesus with our present and our future. How many prayers has God answered for you and been there for you and pulled you through time and time again in your life? Think about those things. Don't let the evil one distract you and convince you that God is not for you because he is. One of my favorite hymns, I do like some hymns. I was raised in a church of Christ, and that's what we sang. We sang hymns every Sunday. And one of the things that jumped out to me, as soon as I heard um, that I was really going to be preaching on this and I was studying It was the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I love this hymn because it talks about the faithfulness of God. And it was written by a man named Thomas Chrysal. And uh, as a testament to God's faithfulness, he had had a very ordinary life, right? Sometimes we like to share these great dramatic things uh, about people's lives to show the faithfulness of God. Well, this guy was just normal. He became a Christian at 27 years old, wanted to go into the ministry, ended up getting sick to the point where he wasn't able to minister. And so he decided to sell insurance. And during selling insurance, he wrote about 1,200 poems. Really, really cool. Wrote about 1,200 poems. And he said this, My income has not been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me until now. And although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care, for which I am filled with astonishing greatness. And when he wrote this hymn, one of the things that he wrote is this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Jesus is faithful, and he proved it to us by hanging on a cross. And so this morning, I leave you with this question. Can you trust Jesus? And the answer is yes. And if you haven't trusted Jesus this morning, the Bible says if you are willing to place that trust in him, 
turn away from your sins. And even though you're not going to be perfect and you're going to make mistakes, God is going to forgive you past, present, and future. And if you're willing to turn away from your sins and be baptized in Jesus' name, you can have the remission of your sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you get to spend forever with God. All you have to do is accept it. Will you stand and pray with me?